afternoon, everyone. Welcome to worship here tonight at Mount Lebanon. Uh, good morning to those of you who will be watching with us tomorrow uh, on, our, on our webcast. Uh, welcome to God's house as we gather around his word to, to listen to the promises that he gives us, to listen to the warnings, especially today, that he gives us in his law and to lift up our voices in praise to him, to lift up our voices to ask him for his help in, in living according to all of his commands. Uh, please take a moment before we start today to, to feel free to check in with us for worship on our website. You, you have your phone with you. You can go to uh, www.themountmke.com slash check-in. And there's an option there when you're checking in to leave any prayer requests that you have. Uh, you can do this too when you get home if you'd rather do it on your computer uh, to check in for worship and share your prayer requests with us so that we can carry those prayers along with you over the course of the coming week. This uh, weekend brings an end to our message series as we've been going through the parables that Jesus told to us in Matthew chapter 13. We'll be focusing on on that final parable from that chapter in our message this, this evening. May God bless your worship today. Please stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
gave his word, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach us always to ask according to your will, that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's word. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the prophecy of Malachi chapter 2. Here the prophet Malachi speaks to us of the coming of the day of the Lord, a day when God will refine with fire like a refiner does with gold, a day when he will purify, Malachi says, like a launderer does with his soul. It's a day when he both purifies the evil from this world and when he purifies his saints of all evil, taking all evil out of them, separating them from that wickedness and evil as he takes them to his side in heaven. We give our attention to the words of Malachi chapters 2 and 3. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then, suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. This is the word of our God. We'll continue with our hymn of the month, Show Us Christ.
Our gospel lesson comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew as we've been following along through that chapter these last five weeks. This is the final parable in this chapter and we'll use this text as the basis for our meditation this weekend. Please stand as we listen to the words of our Savior, Jesus. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish and baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures, as well as old. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue by joining together in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated. We'll join together now in singing our sermon hymn, Here I Am, Lord. In the verses of this hymn, we are going to hear the call of our God to his servants, to his people, asking them, who will go to proclaim the message of my saving grace to the people of this world? And then in the refrain, as we join our voices together there, we join together in answering that call of our God and saying, Lord, here I am, send me. And we'll come back to this, this missional focus as we come to the, the close of our message this evening as well.
grace, mercy, and peace to you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who has washed our sins away, who has cleansed us with his blood, who has crowned us with his righteousness. Amen. Have any of you ever heard the fable of the blind men and the elephant? Go ahead, show of hands if, if you're familiar with that fable. A couple of people, not too many. It's a story about six blind men who, going out one day, encountered for the very first time an elephant. And as each of them walks out to the elephant and reaches out their hand to touch it, they try to communicate to the rest of their blind friends what it is that an elephant is like. But they're limited to just what they can tell from reaching out and touching it. So the first man walking up reaches out and he places his hand onto the side of the elephant and he turns and tells his friend, an elephant is like a wall. But then the second man reaches out and his hand comes onto one of the tusks of the elephant and he says, no, you're wrong. An elephant is like a spear. And the other men in turn reach out to touch the elephant and grabbing hold of the elephant's trunk, one of its ears, reaching around one of its legs. The next three tell the first two and each other that they are all wrong. The, the elephant is like a snake or a big fan or a tree. And finally, the last one reaching out grabs hold of the tail and says, you fools, how can't you see? The elephant is like a rope. And so each and every single one of them was wrong. But if they had worked together, if they had realized their, their limitations and had pulled together what it was that they were finding out about this elephant, they could have come up with a pretty good description of what an elephant looks like. I'm reminded of that fable as we go through and look at Matthew chapter 13. There are some similarities. The, the difference would be that whereas in the fable you have six different people giving a description of something, each with a very limited knowledge of what that something is, here in Matthew chapter 13 we have one person, which is Jesus, giving us six or, or even seven different descriptions of the same thing. And Jesus' knowledge of what he's describing is perfect. There is another difference, obviously. Jesus is not describing to us an elephant. He's describing to us the kingdom of heaven. Now, you and I are able to define the kingdom of heaven. We did that a couple of weeks ago. We said that a good definition to bear in mind is that the kingdom of heaven is the saving and ruling activity of Jesus in this world and in the hearts of people. We can define it easily enough, but how easy is it for us to understand the kingdom of heaven, to wrap our minds around what it is, how it works, what it's going to look like? And so that's why Jesus describes it for us. He does that here in Matthew chapter 13 with this series of parables that we've been listening to now for, this will be our, our fifth week, looking at these seven parables that Jesus tells. And in each one of them, he's describing to us one more aspect, one more thing about the kingdom of heaven. And so we can't just take one of them and think that that's enough. It would be like reaching out and saying, oh, the elephant is like a wall. We would be wrong. But if we take everything that Jesus tells us about the kingdom and we put all of the pieces together, then we're able to come up with a, a rather complete picture of the kingdom, at least with all the pieces that Jesus thought it was necessary for us to have. So let's think back now over the past month and look at the pieces that we've already been given. Four weeks ago, Pastor Borman started off by walking us through the parable of the sower and the seed. And what was it that he wanted us to learn about his kingdom with 
that parable. I think Jesus' main emphasis there is on the reception of the kingdom of heaven, how people receive it. He wanted us to see that it is received through preaching, through telling other people the word. But he also thought it was good for us to see that that message of the word, depending on which heart it reaches out to and touches, is going to be received very differently. Some soaking it up and others outwardly rejecting it. But that those hearts that receive his message when it is proclaimed and, and take it in and in faith believe it, those hearts are going to produce a harvest we heard that could be up to a hundred times what was sown. That they will keep preaching that message to more and more people so that it keeps being received by more and more. The following week then, we heard a parable about how God's kingdom is growing and will continue to grow, even in the midst of the evil and the wickedness in this world. That was the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And Jesus reminded us that that evil is here because it was planted here by an enemy, but that one day that evil will be removed. The next four parables are relatively short. And I think we can break them up into pairs. The first two short little parables we had two weeks ago now, Pastor Borman shared them with us, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. And with both of those parables, Jesus was stressing to us the, the awesome, complete, absolute victory of the kingdom of heaven. A victory, though, which comes from seemingly insignificant beginnings. That it's something small that leads to this tremendous, complete victory. And then last week we had two more parables. The parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl. Where Jesus shows us the, the incomparable value of the kingdom of heaven. That it is worth more than anything in this world. That in fact it is worth more than everything in this world. That we should be willing to give up anything and everything at all. If it means that we can continue seeking that kingdom of heaven. There's no one of those parables that tells us everything about the kingdom of heaven. But we need each and every one because as we start to put them together, we see that this kingdom of heaven it is incredible. That it's something we receive through preaching when we believe it with our hearts. That, that it's worth so much that it grows from something small into something bigger. That it's going to be taking place at the same time as the rest of the evil in this world. And so we get one piece after another as we listen to the parables of Jesus. And and there's at least two dozen other parables that we find outside of Matthew 13. Plus we have all the rest of the teachings of Jesus. And we need to keep looking through everything he's taught us, everything he's said to us, so that we can get the best possible understanding we can have of his kingdom. But why? Why do we need to do that? And I think he answers that question for us with this seventh and final parable here in Matthew chapter 13. It's often called the parable of the net, but I personally don't think that's the best name. I think a better name for it would be the parable of the catching of a whole lot of fish where they were then taken to shore and sorted through and the good ones were kept and the bad ones were thrown away. But that's why they don't let me name the parables. Uh, we can call it the parable of the net because it's easier to remember. But what we can't do is simplify the meaning of this parable or walk away from it thinking what Jesus is telling me in the parable of the net is that the kingdom of heaven is like a net because it's more complex than that. The kingdom is not like a net. The kingdom is like this entire process that Jesus is telling us about here in this parable. This process where this monstrous net is let down into a sea. 
And then as it's dragged along, as we heard earlier in that gospel lesson, it, it begins to collect all of the fish in the sea. Until it's collected all of them and it's full, and then the fishermen pull the net ashore and they start sorting through those fish. And the good ones we heard they place into baskets, but the bad ones they throw away. So what aspect of God's kingdom is he sharing with us here? What's the takeaway that he wants us to know from this parable about the kingdom of heaven? Sometimes we get fortunate and we get some hints from Jesus. He gives us an explanation of a couple of his parables and this is one of those. He makes it pretty clear that that the snapshot we get of the kingdom here is that this is what it will be like at the end of the age when he says the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's important for us to remember that when Jesus talks about the righteous here he's not talking about people who always do what is right. He's talking about those who have been made right because they've been cleansed with the blood of the Lamb. But I think it's interesting to notice as we look at our gospel lesson here that Jesus does not talk much at all about those righteous people. In the parable itself, he says the good fish are collected in baskets. And that's it. But the rest of the parable and all of Jesus' explanation focus instead on the unrighteous, the wicked, who he says are going to be separated from the righteousness and they will be cast into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this last parable is not exactly a parable that's overflowing with gospel love and promises. There is an implicit promise in this parable for those of us who are waiting patiently and longingly for Jesus' return. There's a promise here, I think, that it, that day will come, that we will be separated from the evil in this world, but much more strongly worded in our parable tonight is this warning. This warning that at the end, the evil and the wicked of this world will be excluded from God's kingdom. And not just excluded, but thrown into the flames of hell. So this last parable, the parable of the net, isn't one that ends by saying they all lived happily ever after. So brothers and sisters, what are we supposed to do with this warning? What are we supposed to do with this warning that at the end the evil will be thrown into the fire? First of all, I think we take this warning to heart and we attempt to ensure that when the end comes, when this sorting takes place between the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous, that we will be found and counted among the righteous. And again, that's, that's not as easy as just being those who have always done what is right. Being found among the righteous means that we are counted among those who have been made right. Because we've been washed and cleansed through the blood of Jesus. That's a cleansing that becomes ours through faith in Jesus as our Savior. And so that's the response we want to have to this parable, to this warning. That's what we want to try to ensure, that at the end, we have faith. But how do we do that? How do you ensure that you keep your faith? The scriptures tell us, first of all, that faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard in the word about Jesus. So we want to make sure that we are devoting time to that word, that message. 
that we are taking time out of our lives to listen to what it is that God has to tell us in his word and making a regular habit of it on, on a weekly basis, yes, but even better on a daily be- basis. And I think if we want to be honest with ourselves, we need to be doing it even more than once a day. Because the things that distract us from our faith, that seek to pull us away, don't wait until just once a week or once a day to come sneaking up upon us. Another thing that God's Word tells us is that our faith is strengthened when we are encouraged by our brothers and sisters in the church. And so we want to seek to surround ourselves with other Christians, Christians whom we can reach out to for that encouragement and that support in the times when we need it. And we want to find a church full of believers, a church led by believers that is dedicated to teaching God's word in all of its truth. And then finally, the Bible tells us that our faith is threatened by temptation. And even more so, it is threatened when we fall prey to or sometimes willingly give ourselves into temptation. So we defend ourselves against that, not just by studying God's word so we can stand against temptation, but also by evaluating our lives and striving as much as we can to get rid of the things that would tempt us or the things that would lead us to be tempted. Every single one of us has our own personal faults, our own sins that we are more prone to than others. And if you take some time doing some self-evaluation, you'll be able to identify what some of those are. And those Christians that you're surrounding yourselves with in your life will be able to help you lovingly to, to point out and identify some other ones that you might not be able to recognize as easily yourself. And then you can, with their help maybe, certainly asking God for his help, start trying to find ways where you can stop going down the path of temptation towards those particular sins. Identify what it is that takes you there and stop doing that or get rid of those things so that we can rid our lives of those temptations and instead just fill it with the good things like our Christian friends, like studying God's Word. So I want to invite you, friends, to pause for a minute here and to consider how you can better protect your own faith in the days and weeks to come, whether that's through devoting more time to God's Word, through forging deeper relationships with other Christians around you, or through ridding your lives of temptation or the things that lead to temptation. Let's take just a moment to consider those things and ask our God for his help with them. It's imperative for us to get rid of the evil and the wickedness in our lives. It's imperative because, as our parable tells us, at the end, the wicked will be separated from the good and will be cast into the fire. So what we do with our lives, friends, each and every day is of vital importance for us and for our salvation. It matters what we do with our lives. It matters the decisions that we make, whether they're taking us farther away from Jesus or taking us closer to him. And so we want to take heed of this warning that Jesus has given us, but I don't want you to despair. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be terrified by that warning. Because friends, 
God's word gives us more than a warning. It points us to Jesus and it shows us what he's done for us. It assures us that he has cleansed us of sin. That he has made us righteous. Crowned us with his righteousness as we're going to see in our closing hymn. And and robed us with his blood. So that you can go forward with all the confidence of faith. Knowing that on that day, that even right now today, you stand among the righteous. You can be confident in that. And in that confidence, then, I think we're able to look at this warning from Jesus from another angle, too. That it's not just a warning about what might happen to us if we would give up on our faith and grow lax in in listening to God's word, start taking his gifts for granted. It's not just a warning of what might happen to us. It's a warning, then, also of what will happen to the countless millions of people out there in this world who do not have faith, who do not know Jesus, and who will be thrown into the fires of hell on that day if they are not at some point before then turned from their sin to God. And we know that it's God who does that turning. It is God who creates faith in the hearts of people, faith in Jesus as their Savior, faith that leads them to turn and repent from their sins. But the scriptures tell us in another place, how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So let's pause once more, brothers and sisters, and think back to the song we just sang before our sermon about who it is that God is asking, who shall I send? Who in your life are you able to give the answer, is it I, Lord? Here I am. Send me to that person. Let me tell them about Jesus. Think about the, the impact, the difference that you can make, not in someone's life, but in their eternity, by sharing Jesus with them so that they, like you, can be spared from that fire on the last day. Let's take a moment to think about that and ask for God's help as we witness what he's done for us and for the world with the people in our lives. Brothers and sisters, let's be alert and on our guard and watch over, guard over, and protect our faith at all costs in this life, clinging to Jesus in everything. And let us also, and again, at all costs, daringly and audaciously move forward in our efforts to share the gospel of Jesus with others so that along with us they may be found righteous and spared on the last day. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll continue to collect our offering in the basket that's on the table as you leave. You're welcome to leave your offerings there. You can also send them into our office here at church at any time during the week, or you can give online at themountmke.com slash give. Uh, We'll take this time then, rather than collecting our offerings, to to give our attention to uh, a 90-second video that, that teaches us about stewardship and about how we... We look at the gifts that God has given to us and give back from them to Him. Stewardship in 90 seconds or less. Let's review real quick, and I mean quick. First, everything we have in our lives is God's. He has entrusted it all to us. Second, when we say that stewardship applies to everything in our lives, we mean everything. Yes, everything. Third, When we use these gifts well and in faith, God is pleased with us and with our giving. 
So the question now before us is this, in what part of my life am I to do this? Does stewardship only apply to church giving and volunteering and serving? Is that the best and only way to give back to God? No, not at all. God has given us everything in our lives and he wants us to use those gifts in every part of our lives. Yes, in every part of our lives. Yes, stewardship does mean that we will use God's gifts to support the work of our congregation and the ministry we are doing here. But that's not all. Stewardship also means that we will use the gifts God has given us to take care of our families and to provide for their needs. And stewardship means that we will use the gifts that God has given to care for the poor, the homeless, the orphans, and others who really need our help. God has given us everything in our lives so that we can use it wisely in every part of our lives. Stewardship, then, is a whole life activity and not just reserved for church. Please stand for the prayer of the church. As we join our hearts together in the prayer of the church, I will read each of the petitions, and at the end of those petitions, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, at which point you're invited to join together with me in, in praying, Lord, hear our, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we don't presume to know your ways or inform your judgment. We ask you to grant us your Holy Spirit so that we may understand your ways and know your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. Give us wisdom that we may trust in your word amid the stormy seas of this mortal life and be safely delivered from all danger onto the eternal shores of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord our God, we have no righteousness of our own, but only the righteousness of Christ into which we were clothed in baptism. Grant us grace that we may be faithful in every circumstance and bold in the confession of his saving name. Guard those who preach your word to us so that, hearing, we may believe, and believing, we may have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O oh Lord our God, we see the great need and ask you to raise up those who will serve us as pastors, teachers, missionaries, and in all church work vocations. Bless church planters and the younger congregations that they may endure. Bring hope and renewal to all struggling congregations and to the pastors who serve them. And do not let fear keep us from your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord our God, we remember the sick, those who suffer, those troubled in mind, the grieving and the dying. Deliver them according to your will and grant them the comfort of your word in their afflictions, that they may depend upon your mercy in every circumstance. Here is especially for all those affected recently by storms and disasters or by civil unrest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord our God, we give thanks for the saints of old who trusted you in life and now rest in Christ from all their labors. Deliver us from all evil and lead us through all temptation so that at last we may join them in the marriage supper of the Lamb, in your kingdom, without end. Hear us especially for Lorraine Jacobson and Scott Heinrich, whom you have called to your side. We praise you for their faith. We thank you that they now rest in your presence. We ask you to comfort and console all those who mourn their passing. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O Lord our God, we pray you to be our light in darkness, our strength in weakness, our courage in fear, and our peace in distress. Speak to us by the voice of your word that we may call upon you in the day of trouble and confess your saving name before all people. Hear us on behalf of ourselves and those for whom we have prayed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing song is the hymn, Lord, When Your Glory I Shall See. It's a hymn that reminds us why we do not have to fear, even as we look at the warnings of God's law. We sing about how he has robed us in his blood and crowned us with his righteousness and how with those we do not need to fear or tremble as we come before him on that day. Uh, I was blessed to be able to sing through this song with Lorraine uh, and her family earlier this week, the day before she was there, standing before Jesus. And so it's a wonderful comfort for, for all of us of that joy that we have as we look forward to the day that Jesus calls us to his throne. his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Welcome once again to all of you. Thank you so much for joining with us for worship here today. A uh, couple of announcements as we bring our worship tonight to a close. Um, the first announcement is that we will have a new session of Connect Groups starting soon. Uh, we hope to have those groups and the days and times that they will be meeting finalized, um, hopefully by Monday this week. And so we'll be getting that information to you so that you can uh, see which group will work best for you and sign up to join it. Um, we saw tremendous blessings through these groups in our first session earlier in in the late spring and into the summer and so we we pray for the same thing now as we bring our summer to a close in our worship service we talked a little bit today in our message about devoting more time to studying god's word that's going to be the particular focus as we gather for worship next sunday uh, where we'll be um, looking at it not only in our worship but also in a bible study afterwards how we can 
get the most out of the time that we are offering to God, the time that we're devoting to studying His Word. So if you want to learn what SOAP 3.0 even means, join us next Sunday uh, as we gather for worship. We will only be worshiping at our 9.30 service on Sunday next week. We won't have our 5.30 uh, p.m. Saturday service because it's the holiday weekend. Um, we do invite you, though, Heather and I would like to invite you on Saturday uh, next week to join us. We're having an open house uh, in celebration of our marriage that will go from 12.30 to 3.30 here at the Parsonage. We'll be hopefully mostly outside, weather permitting, and so we'd like to invite all of you to join us for that. Uh, then our final announcement is that tomorrow morning after our worship service, we will have our semi-annual voters meeting. Um, so all of you are invited to, to come back and join us for that meeting to hear the reports of everything that's been going on for this past half year. And, and our voting members especially, we ask um, if you're able to be there for that meeting that, that you would uh, be able to attend. Those are all the announcements I have. Uh, Pastor Borman or anybody else, if you have any others. Otherwise, God bless you all and, and have a wonderful week.